All right, everybody. Welcome to uh, Drew's virtual happy hour. Uh, basically, what this is designed to do is help us escape this pandemic, give us a little bit of normalcy and talk spirits. And uh, I'm very, very happy and excited to have the chief executive for Pendaren Distillery, Stephen Davies, with us tonight. Um, Stephen, thank you so much for waking up at an ungodly hour and joining us and making sure to have some coffee ready. And, you know, you already look like you're ready and ready to rock and full of energy. I'm feeling good. Sur surprisingly, I'm feeling good, Drew. So you feel good now. I mean, you might have different feelings about me like at two o'clock in the afternoon over there. We just kind of like... I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, let, I'll let you know. Don't you worry. <laughs> uh, good. So just so everybody knows, um, you know, if you have any questions throughout, go ahead and, and put them into the chat. I'll do my best to stay on top of those. I might not ask them right away, but eventually I will get to it. And then, um, it's even just so you know, this is, I do have a lot of set questions, but, you know, we'll kind of just see where the conversation takes us and, and all that fun stuff. Um, so in taking the Google Dive into your career and stuff like that, you've actually done a pretty good job of keeping your, your past a mystery. Um, oh. You know, it kind of it starts in uh, 2005. I know you were in the steel industry before you made the transition to whiskey, where I believe at one point you said it made you a much more popular person amongst your friends, uh, going yeah, from yeah. steel to whiskey. Yeah. And then... Well, when, uh, when you work in, sorry, when you work in the steel industry, you know, um, it's a great industry. Fabulous. I really enjoyed it. But people don't sort of really, they, oh, you work in the steel industry. That's kind of nice. But when you run a distillery, it's a different thing entirely. You do what? Come and sit down. Let's have a chat. Let me talk arm around you. Yeah, it's kind of, um, I, I call that the, the, hap, or the cocktail hour test. It's that, you know, depending on, on what you give that answer at, at a cocktail hour, like how interesting your job really is. You know, if you yeah. get those follow-up questions, it's like, hey, you have a cool job. If you don't get those follow-up questions, uh, you know, they're pretty much right out, right out the door on you. So I'm sure yeah, that. I keep, I keep kidding myself that it's me, but it's, it's Pandarian really. So. Uh. <laughs> well, I, I mean, you know, we'll get into it, but obviously you've seen an exceptional amount of growth, you know, over during your tenure. But, but I am curious and I, you know, I want to keep it kind of with your origins. Um, you know, yeah. where, you know, where did your story start? Where were you, were you born? And then kind of, you know, maybe just like a brief history of kind of what eventually got you to this position with Pandaren. Yeah. Okay. Look, I've got a couple of slides, which we'll come to if that's okay, but just. Of course. Yeah. The background in terms of me, I mean, I'm, I'm calling you from my, my home, which is, um, in a place called Port Talbot, which is in South Wales, near, near well, halfway between Swansea and Cardiff um, on the South Wales coast. And Port Talbot, if you ever, had ever heard of it, but it's probably a bit like uh, that Wuhan there, uh, you'd only know Port Talbot if you knew anything about the steel industry, because we have one of the biggest integrated steelworks um, in the world, and the only fully integrated steel plant now left in, in Wales or in the UK. Um, so I grew up in the steel town, uh, went off and got a semblance of an education, um, but then ended up coming back and working for British Steel. So that's where I started my working life. Um, <clears throat> during the course of that, I ended up moving from the steelmaker into a, a private family company with a chap called Nigel Short. Um, and that's my link to Pendarin because Nigel today is the biggest investor and shareholder in our company. Um, and I worked with Nigel for, for many years, probably probably about 15 years in the steel business. Um, and he knew I liked whiskey. And when, when he sold his, his family company and then started looking at this crazy business in, in the Welsh Valleys um, uh, to make whiskey for the first time in Wales for over 100 years, um, he, he obviously thought of me and thought, hang on, whenever we used to go out, that guy used to drink single malt. Um, and, and that's how we got the conversation going. So. I joined Pendarin um, at the back end of 2004. They'd actually started distilling in 2000. Uh, the 14th of September 2000 was the first time that whiskey had been distilled in Wales for over 100 years. Um, and, um, and, you know, so I joined, they'd kind of been distilling for a while, but they didn't really have too many customers. Um, the, the, the brand was in its embryo, very much its embryonic stage. So my job was to sort of organize the business, uh, look for distribution, look for distribution in Europe, in the States, uh, around, around the world, and start to run, run the business, um, I don't know, perhaps a bit more professionally than had been done before, but 
th there was a lot of passion and enthusiasm and you know and, and the people that who'd been involved before um nigel had invested were all just that you know they'd run out of money and then they'd get their next door neighbor involved or their brother-in-law involved and the, you know the enthusiasm was there but they just needed a bit more just to get the momentum going um, and so, uh, so I, you know, when I joined, it was a, it was very much a tin shed in the Brecon Beacons. Uh, Brecon Beacons National Park is one of the most beautiful areas of, of the UK, and certainly of Wales. And um, you know, but our building was um, um, actually there was an there was an American journalist who came to visit us in I think it was two thousand and five, and she went away and said, I can't believe. She said, I can't believe this beautiful whiskey is made in a ratty shed in the Brecon Beacons. Um, and that kind of summed it up at the time. All, all the efforts were going into the whiskey and a little bit into the brand. And um, the, the, the building, the distillery building, didn't, it was not a pretty site. You know, the, uh, the car park was full of potholes. The, the building was kind of half falling down. Um, uh, but we attended, you know, we got to that. Uh, but in the early days, it was all, all very, very basic. Right. Yeah. So it sounds like, you know, you kind of had this, you know, like the artist, right, that they have all these aspirations and they have this way of executing it, but they needed someone with that business sense to kind of be like, all right, guys, let's cross some T's, dot some I's, and then make this a legit business. It kind of seems like that's where you came in. Um, and so in, in looking at it, so, you know, you talk about the distillation in 2000 and then um, the launch was, you know, kind of like the first barrel dump was on, uh, St. David's Day in 2004. And I remember reading um, one thing that you had talked about where it said, you're fortunate to have the investors that you guys did because, you know, after three and a half, four years of waiting as this whiskey aged, you didn't know how it was going to turn out, you know, and you had all these people involved that you're just like, God, I hope this, I hope this goes well. Now, were you around for that first dump? Because I know, in terms of your job title, it says you started in 2005, in January of 2005. So that would have been about, you know, eight, eight months-ish after the yeah. first uh, barrel dump. So were you at that event when it happened no, or I, did you come in after? No, I wasn't actually. And it, the event was 1st of March, 2004, as you say. Uh, I didn't, I really got involved, started having discussions with the business in, in, in the May or the June um, after they, you know, launched the business. But um, you, you're right. I mean, the guy who had the original idea for Penderin, uh, a guy called Alan Evans, who was a local publican, he owned a pub uh, in an adjoining village to Penderin. As you know, the name of the brand Penderin is also the name of the village uh, where we're based. He had had this idea to bring whiskey making back, but really he didn't have a lot of idea of what to do with it. Um, and, you know, for the first couple of years, they kind of struggled along. But fairly early on, they got a guy called Dr. Jim Swan involved. And, you know, really in terms of the style of the whiskey and the, the direction of the, the company from a technical point of view, that was, um, whether, whether it was um, luck or good judgment, it was a, a really inspirational move because without Dr. Swan, you know, the business wouldn't have, wouldn't have made any progress because um, he gave the, the business the, the knowledge and then subsequently the credibility to really to, to move things forward. But, you, but you're right in saying that when they first started distilling, they had no idea what this whiskey was going to taste like. It was either, you know, blind faith or, you know, it was crazy. Um, because even though the whiskey still um, that we have, uh, which is designed by a guy called Dr. David Faraday, makes a very, very beautiful and quite unique spirit. Um, they didn't know at the time that that, was, that that would turn into something really valuable. So I think there was a lot of, um, uh, you know, ambition, a lot of passion, and not necessarily a lot of, of, of real knowledge at that early stage. But by getting somebody like Jim Swan involved, I think that, that really um, helped the process greatly. So let me, let me put a few slides up, just, and, and please interrupt me as, as, as we go, okay? okay. Um, so I'll just put this on. So I'm going to jump the first couple of slides because we've, oh, we don't want that to start with. Let's start here. Okay. So, <clears throat> yeah, so, so, these, so this is the branding as it, as it is now. So, so the, the, the business um, back in those days, the, the launch was in a place called the St. David's Hall in Cardiff, 
and the Prince of Wales uh, was one of the first people to taste the whiskey. And uh, as I'm sure you guys know, Wales is not a terribly well-known part of, of the UK, certainly not compared to someone like Scotland. Um, so to have someone like His Royal Highness Prince Charles there at the launch, I think was, um, was a good move, uh, brought a lot of good publicity. But you know, in, in truth, the company wasn't really ready. Um, the first batch of whiskey was very small. And um, even though the company had huge um, uh, publicity and, and profile over that event, the whole thing sort of did die out quite quickly because there wasn't a lot of follow up and there wasn't a lot of stock to follow up on either. But you know what it's like. I mean, the, the pressure on being able to, um, to launch a, a whiskey project is enormous because um, of, of resources, cash. Um, and so the feeling was that uh, it was a tremendously successful launch but actually it had probably come a little bit too soon um, because the, the, the company wasn't quite ready. Um, and so you've got that feeling of, well, this new whiskey on the market, uh, I've heard it's pretty good. Um, certainly people like Jim Murray like it, but you can't get it. Um, and, and that's what it was like for a, a few months. So when I, when I got involved, there was a sense of, well, we've had that initial momentum and now we've kind of lost the, the impetus. We've, we've, lost the, we've lost it a little bit and we've got to really regain it pretty quickly. So it's, you know, I, I feel like really what you were going to bring to the table, you know, was like a practical attack plan. You know, I think it's a pretty classic thing for anybody who tends to be a little bit, you know, when you're, when you're almost too ambitious, you're like, hey, that's rolled out right now. Like, we can't wait. We love it so much. And then you were brought in to kind of be like, okay, like, slow down. Let's do it this way. This is how we're going to build. To build. And I think with that being the case, you know, I'm sure you had had of that moment where you're coming from the steel industry, like you've built businesses before. Now you're getting into something that you like, but you're not completely familiar with it. And you're also coming into a scenario, as you mentioned earlier, where there has not been any distillation of whiskey in Wales for over a hundred years. Like for you, I mean, was there apprehension to, to do that? Was it like, hey, I'm going to just bet on myself because I know that we have something? Or like, what was that final factor that was kind of like, yeah, I can, I can do this? Well, I, I went from a situation, um, I was working in the steel industry, the company that I was working for had been bought out by a big Australian uh, PLC uh, called Brambles Industries, Brambles. And um, I was going, I was flying to Paris every month uh, for meetings and to Brussels. Uh, the occasional trip to Australia or to um, the, the Far East. And it was very, you know, I mean, it was, it was a really nice um, experience. But ultimately, I, I, I didn't really want to be in that big corporate environment. And I, I was very attracted to the idea of, of being in a small business and being in a branded business, which, which I really wasn't doing. I was in, in a business to business setting um, where relationships are very important, but there was no branding. So that was the big thing, I think, for me. But, but what really sold me on the idea of Pendarin was going up to this, you know, basic tin shed, um, walking into the area, which is now the visitor center, actually, which some of you guys, uh, I know, have seen. But in those days was the bond. It was the, it was the, the, where, the bonded warehouse where all the, the, what whiskey stocks we had were located. And you know that feeling um, of just walking into the bonded area and being hit by that beautiful, um, sweet smell of the, you know, the Madeira casks are maturing, um, the, the smell of the bourbon barrels, and standing in a room which was really disorganized, where the, the, the barrels were st all stacked up. They were really stacked unsafely. They were all on you know, little um, wooden wedges between them, uh, like they were gonna fall down any minute. Um, but, but that feeling of just being around these barrels, and I just thought, wow, well, you know, I'd always liked malt whiskey. My, my father had introduced me to single malts when I was, um, 17 or 18, uh, things like Macallan and Highland Park and um, Isle of Jura. So I kind of had a, 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 a I think, a very basic appreciation. Uh, but just standing in this room, looking around, thinking, you know, this is this is fabulous. You know, um, and and at the end of the day, how difficult could it be to sell 100,000 bottles of single malt? I'm sure I can do that. You know, what was I thinking? Um, and in those days, that was the ambition. You know, we were only making one barrel of whiskey a day. And uh, we, were, we were looking to, um, you know, really sort of build on that. But, but what I liked about it and what I liked about the conversations was that everybody was saying, look, this isn't about um, making, making money. It's not about, um, you know, making quick profits or anything. This is about building a brand and building quality. 
and, 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 the, and the only demands on this are going to be, let's do it properly and let's do it and make sure that any whiskey we release is going to be good and, and nothing will go out um, without that. And we were fortunate, the guy I mentioned, Nigel, uh, Nigel Short, who's our main investor, I knew because I'd worked with him for, for a number of years in the steel industry that I, I knew that he was prepared to be patient with us and um, would, would allow us that bit of room to grow, which up until that point, the business hadn't had that facility. Um, so, so that was important. I mean, let me show you, um, before, we, before we go any further, I mean, we talked about uncertain times, guys. I'm just step out of the story for a minute, but five weeks ago, uh, I was, can you, I, if you can see the slides, um, I was stood in Downing Street with uh, Nigel Short there is on the left, and I'm presenting a bottle to, to the UK Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. Um, and in five weeks, we've gone from that to what we're doing right now, which is making hand sanitizer um, from some of our spirit, just to keep um, the, the hospitals in the UK going. So we've kind of, well, the last few weeks have been a bit crazy. I've been a bit crazy, but um, you know, jumping back into the business, um, this was what we had when we started. I mean, the, the history of Welsh whiskey is very patchy, um, but we did have a bit of history. And um, there was a previous distillery which had been in the northern part of Wales. And they had stopped distilling around 1898, um, but they had, um, they had made a bit of a mark for themselves. And there's a, we own a, a bottle of whiskey which must be 120 years old from this distillery. Um, and what we were looking at was, you know, can we bring this sort of back to Wales? It wasn't a huge tradition. It wasn't, um, I think, you know, that long in, in, in duration. But we had this, we had people like Evan Williams, who um, had, his family had emigrated to Virginia and then to Kentucky. And as, as we all know, Evan Williams is one of the founding fathers of the bourbon industry. So we had sort of a patchy history to build on, um, but not a lot, you know, not a lot. And so um, it was those, we were just sat there thinking, how can we do this? Well, we're not gonna obviously copy what happened hundred years ago because whiskey a hundred years ago wouldn't have been, um, something to really taste and savor because it, it wouldn't have been matured in the way that we do it now. So we had to find a whole new identity. And um, fortunately, uh, we had the, the Pendarin Faraday whiskey still to build that around. And also, you know, in, with incredible um, good fortune, having Dr. Jim Swan um, to work with then to be able to, to, to work that out. Right, so then, you know, part of, part of like that the the distillation and everything like that is um you guys actually have an all female team that's that's making the whiskey and one of the things that you guys say is like it's kind of just like a happy accident that it wasn't the intention to have this all female team but it's just the way that things go and so i just want to you know you know ask you like what has that influence been like and how is that translated to the market you know when it comes to like talking about the the distillation because you know, you just don't hear that very often is, is the reality. Well, let me take you through it then. So, so in terms of the distillation, I mean, this, this is, you can see the slider right there. Yeah. This is our whiskey still. Yep. Uh, it's a single copper pot with, with two columns. Um, and, you know, as I say, this has been a very important part because one of the nice things about Pendarin is it's not a copy of Scotch whiskey. We never set out to be a lookalike in any shape or form. Um, you know, as I say, part, part of it was, was passion, part of it maybe was good fortune. Um, but we have this um, the whiskey still designed by Dr. David Faraday. The, the whiskey still came out of a European project um, where a number of people were involved, but we were the only pe people who took it forward and, and made it into a commercial venture, if you like. Um, that's what the stills look like. So obviously they're, they're, they're lovely uh, copper stills. We, we had one still back in, in 2000. We've got two of these stills um, now. Um, and just to complete the picture on, on the distillations, um, but this is how it works. So you've got the, the, the single copper pot, um, the wash goes into the pot at around about 8% alcohol by volume. Uh, we have, a, it's quite a long process of distillation, it's about a 10 hour cycle, much slower than um, pot stills. And um, basically uh, the, the really nice thing about our spirit, when we pull the spirit out, uh, which comes out of the, um, the spirit safe, uh, it comes out at 92% alcohol by volume. It's a very high spirit draw. And the reason that you need to think about that is not because it's better than pot still spirit, but it is different. It's, it's lighter, it's a lot less oily, 
um, and it's um, you know it, it's very very attractive, and, and that gave us a point of difference. Um, you can see from the diagram as it's unfolding here. Um, not only do we have a, a route of, from the, the, the pot through the columns to the, um, the draw point of the spirit uh, safe, but we've also got a recycling feature as well. So any spirit that goes to the bottom of the second column gets recycled to, to the head of the first column. So you've got six plates in the first column, you've got um, 18 plates in the second column. There's a lot going on with this still. You know, it's, it's a, it is a, we call it a pot still, but it's a bit of a hybrid. It's got, you know, it's pot and column, but it's a batch process. Um, and it does give us that sort of point of difference. Um, Stephen, we have a question for you. Um, yes. You know, with this still, it, you know, it's kind of reminiscent of like hybrid stills that, that you see in the U.S. when it comes to like craft distilleries and, and things yeah. like that. There's some slight similarities. And um, one of our uh, guys with impacts is, is wondering, do you think that this particular still will prove to be more economical for the future of whiskey production? Well, it, it's, it's certainly um, based on the premise that the, uh, the energy costs for running the still are lower than running pot stills. And um, Dr. Swan actually wrote a paper on that when he, when he first got involved. Um, so yes, I think there are some advantages, but the problem is, of course, nobody in Scotland would, would really use this still because if you made whiskey on this still in Scotland, you, you could call it malt whiskey, but I don't think you'd be able to call it scotch. And, and, and I don't think anybody in Scotland wants to make whiskey and not call it scotch. So um, it, it's, it's a more, I guess, more modern uh, answer to making single malt whiskey. Um, and, you know, I say we find it's a very attractive style. It, it, it's something back in 2007, I was very concerned to really understand a bit more about the still. So we got Dr. Swan. We got a guy, uh, David Faraday, who had done the design work and another gentleman from Scotland uh, called Bill Rankin. And we, I had them for three days and said, look, guys, let's sit down and let's really please explain to me how this all works. After three days, I was none the wiser. Um, <laughs> They're all there saying, well, you know, we can tell you the basics of this, but um, there's a lot we don't really quite know. And it needs a bit more experimentation. It needs a bit more work. Um, frankly, we haven't, over the years, we, we've just kind of used the still. We found um, a way of working which really produces a beautiful spirit for us. And we don't deviate too much from that. And now we've got two of these stills. Um, you think there'd be time for research and uh, academic study, but there isn't really because we've got it all on to keep producing spirit and laying spirit down and trying to build some age in the warehouse. So um, it's, it, all I can say is it really works for us and it's a bit of a one-off and, uh, and we love it. So totally. And, you know, so with, uh, you know, with you guys starting this distillery up, you know, you have this opportunity, you know, to create a single malt. You don't, you're not, you know, hampered or restricted by the rules of Scotch whiskey. You can kind of dictate what this is going to be. And, you know, Two of those factors is you guys do a non-chill filtered whiskey and there's no color added. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that's common amongst Jim Swan whiskeys. But, you know, for you guys, I mean, what was what was some of that discussion like and why were those why were those two things important when it came to making Welsh whiskey? Well, um, I, I think actually the, the non-chill filter was easy because the, the nature of the spirit that we, we pull out of this still means that you can actually bottle it down to, well, we bottle down to 41% in the UK uh, for our myth, Celt and legend, which we do for you guys at 43%, but in the UK it's bottled at 41. And we don't need to chill filter uh, because the, the, the profile of the spirit is such um, that we don't, it doesn't throw a chill haze. We don't get any issues of, of cloudiness. Um, and so we've, we've never had an issue with, uh, with, with having to chill filter whiskey. And of course, if you chill filter, you, you inevitably lose some character out of the whiskey, whether it be flavor or color or both. Um, so we've been lucky because of the, the, the style of the still, we haven't needed to do that. In terms of um, color, we, we've, apart from one um, brief venture back in 2007, where we tried adding a bit of color, it was a complete disaster and we didn't like it. And we had a huge row with them um, between Jim Swan and Jim Murray the Whiskey Bible guy. Uh, and actually, Jim Swan was on the um, side of a little bit of um, uh, flavorless caramel um, is okay in a whiskey because it can add mouthfeel and, and it can be something that just adds to the whiskey. And Jim Murray was of, and still is of the opinion, 
it, you know, it, in, anything you put in like that will never be completely flavorless and you should never do it. And uh, we sat around, uh, we were in the distillery in Wales and Jim, Jim Murray looked at me and Jim Swan and said, you put any color in this, I'll never ever speak to either of you again. Um, <laughs> and I will call you out and I will t tell people how awful, what awful people you are. Um, and, and, and we were kind of, we had that debate and we, and we decided in the end that we didn't either need to or want to, to add any, any caramel or any color. So we've never done it. Um, but that was more of a, as far as I remember, really clearly remember Jim Swan saying, well, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but of course, I think in terms of market position and perceptions, I think we did the right thing in not, in not adding. But, yeah. but let me just, I'm moving towards, in, in terms of my, my slides here, I'm moving towards the lady distillers. I haven't forgotten your question there. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Before we get to that, I mean, the one other thing that um, uh, was very important from a Jim Swan point of view, so we've got two um, Penderin Faraday stills, if you like. But one of the things that Jim gave us, and as I'm sure you know, Jim passed away now, I think it's just over three years ago, which was a huge loss, not just for us, but for the industry. And, um, you know, but one of the things he did for us uh, in the last few years of his life was say, he said to me one day, you know, if you're going to expand the distillery, um, I would suggest adding a pair of pot stills because as lovely as the Penderin spirit is, it will only ever produce this very, very light spirit, this very light whiskey. And if you want a bit more body and a bit more um, weight, perhaps, to some of the whiskies you produce, then, then I'd recommend pot stills. Um, but these pot stills that you can see on the screen, they're, they're lantern-shaped stills. They're very much like the Glenlivet stills, only an awful lot smaller. Um, and they, they produce a, a very light pot still spirit. So we weren't trying to get something that was a complete contrast. This is a very, very light, and they were designed to complement what we already had. Okay. Um, and, they, and they do. And I mean, they give us the, the spirit that can, we get from these stills is really beautiful. Uh, but it's a, it is heavier and, and oilier than, than the uh, original Penderin spirit. So, um, so, th so that component, which we haven't used particularly in anger yet, uh, we still, we've been maturing that spirit now for, must be coming up for six years. Um, but it's something that we intend to use a bit more of as, as we go. Uh, it's all single malt, it's all within, within the same distillery, but it gives us another um, option or string to our bow, if, if you like. Okay. Um, and um, I mentioned the water as well, obviously, just to, so you know. Um, our water source is, uh, comes from underneath the distillery. It's a natural spring. Um, it's a very consistent water supply. This is a local um, uh, waterfall called Scuderaira, lovely Welsh name, which is in the Brecon Beacons. It's about uh, an hour's hike, an hour's walk from, uh, from the distillery. And um, we have a number of, you know, we're in an area where there's a number of waterfalls. Uh, very beautiful limestone, um, carboniferous limestone uh, rock uh, landscape. It's very, very beautiful. And the other thing that Jim gave us, and I think this is sometimes underappreciated um, by distilleries when they start up, is a real focus on, on the wood. You know, the creativity that Dr. Swan gave us in terms of wood management was really superb and part of the legacy that we enjoy now, you know, um, after his days. Uh, but, you know, when you're a small distillery making only malt whiskey, then the choice of wood is critical because you're, you know, you've nothing to blend with. If you've got any issues or whiskies which are a bit ordinary, a bit lacking in character, you can't do anything with it. So we, you know, um, we've worked very hard on, on the wood management and uh, obviously bourbon barrels, buying very good quality bourbon barrels, but also these um, Madeira casks. And as I'm sure you know, Penderin is a uh, Madeira finished whiskey. Um, and so, so Jim gave us this, this wonderful legacy in terms of uh, wood management and um, being able to, and, you know, help to set up the relationships for very long-term procurement of wood. And that's I'll, something that you guys are... If, are you wanna, if there's anything you want to ask. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think that's where... And I kind of wanted that conversation to go anyways, because the barrel program is, you know, really interesting. And, um, you know, with so many people going about it, you know, just with bourbon cask and, uh, you know, you obviously see a lot of sherry influence out there too, which I know you guys have, but, you know, the Madeira was kind of a unique choice. And then I, I remember hearing at one point, I can't, I can't remember the source, but the, the Celt 
uh, expression was actually kind of like a happy accident. Again, like you guys actually, you know, you had, you had put a bunch of things in barrels and then you taste it and you're like, whoa, there's some pee to that. And then you're actually like, oh, that's probably because it came from a certain distillery infamous yeah. for, for that. So is that true? Is that, is that actually how the Kelp happened? Yeah, yeah. So it was actually, yeah. So we have two PT whiskeys. We have Pandarin Kelt in our Dragon Range and we have Pandarin Peated, which is in the, in the Gold Range. Um, yeah, how that came about, you know, when you, when you start a new distillery, you, you need um, first fill barrels and you need some second fill barrels as well. You don't put it all just into the same. Um, so we had gone off, our guys had gone to Scotland and they'd bought barrels to act as second fills. And I think they'd gone to, I think it was Speyside Cooperage at the time. And they came back and, and five of the barrels that they had bought um, were from Isla. Um, and you, you would have think they would, they would have noticed this because they had Lefroy stamped on them in bloody big letters. Okay. But nobody noticed at the time. This was the level of perhaps um, knowledge and understanding. And we just filled these barrels with our spirit. And many years later, probably about five years later, and I was sat in the office and uh, Dr. Swan came in one day and said, oh, we've got a bit, bit of a problem. So what's that, Jim? He said, well, um, I've come across this whiskey in the warehouse, he said, and um, it doesn't really fit with, with the Pendering style because it's, um, it's a bit smoky. You know, it's taken a little bit of smokiness out of the, out of the casks. Um, but it's, it's really nice. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased with it, but I don't know what to do with it. Um, so we sort of sat around had a cup of coffee and I think, and he said, well, normally what you do in these situations is distilleries do a special edition, you know, that, that, that'll get rid of it. You know, we'll sort of sort it out. Um, and so we did that. We did a, a I think it was a thousand bottle special edition, a uh, hundred pounds a bottle. Um, and he was very, you know, he was pleased with the whiskey, but it just didn't fit with what, what we were doing. And about, I don't know, a month later, I get a phone call and it's, uh, it's Jim Murray, the, the Whiskey Bible, and we'll talk a bit more about Jim as we go. And I'd never spoken to Jim before. It was the first time I'd spoken to him. I was a bit nervous on the phone. And uh, he said, I've just tasted your PT whiskey. It's absolutely amazing. He said, you, you should do this as a regular thing, you know, and we only had five barrels and they were all just gone. Um, and I remember he wrote in the Whiskey Bible that year that uh, Pendarin's PT whiskey is almost the stuff of erotic dreams. Um, well, what can you say, you know, as, as somebody who, you know, is in the business of selling whiskey, I thought, well, that's, that's a pretty good recommendation. Um, and that's how it started. But, but it was actually Pendarin Peated in those days, rather than the Celt came up a bit later. Um, but you're right, the origin of those whiskies really came from that sort of happy accident. Um, and so our PT whiskies are barrel finishes. And, um, you know, we, 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 we don't commercially use, uh, obviously, any Isla uh, distillery name but we we do get isla barrels now and um uh and they and it's very nice you know it, it imparts this very light smoky peatiness which isn't always apparent on the nose but it really sort of really pushes through then um on, on the taste which which has been great for us you know it's just added a you know a bit of interest to the to, the, to what we do so when it comes to achieving you know that kind of consistency because you know obviously if you do it by accident you're kind of like oh crap, how can we, you know, make this a little bit more consistent? Um, whether it's, whether it's the Celt, whether it's the, you know, the Madeira, the Port, you know, any, any of those expressions, uh, is there a, a cooperage that you guys are consistently working with, or are you kind of just sourcing what you can get your hands on? How does that, how does that change from one expression to the next? Um, yeah, in term, I mean, obviously, in terms of bourbon barrels, we, we have good regular supplies from people like Buffalo Trace Distillery, who've been very good with us all, over the years. Um, because we, I mean, prior to working with, with um, uh, Sam and, and you guys, um, uh, we, were with, we were actually with Sazerac. They, they were distributing us, but, but they were, I mean, nice company, but too big for us. You know, we couldn't get any airtime in terms of our, our brand. But one of the things that came out of that was the, the, our ability to get very nice, very good quality bourbon barrels, which we've been always been thrilled with. And then in terms of Madeiras, you know, we have uh, relationships with probably five, I think it is, um, wineries on the island of Madeira. And you can see this Malvasia barrel on, on the screen here. Um, I don't know if you know, but um, the history of Madeira is, I think is fascinating. You know, Madeira wine was huge in America, in the US, 
prior to prohibition it was it was a, a booming industry for the island but when prohibition came along and the business stopped overnight and then when prohibition was abolished um you guys didn't go back to drinking madeira wine you kind of moved on to other things so the madeira industry um really struggled after that but Madeira wine, when it's done well, is really beautiful and elegant. And so we've, what we found is by being, again, a little bit different to the, to the Scotch industry, by use, by majoring on Madeira, which we can do because we're not a huge distillery, um, that has really helped us define the house style, if you like, of, of, of Pandera. The Malvasia um, grape um, is, is very important. We also use Tinta Negra, and we, we're using other um, uh, varietals as well. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the, the focus on quality barrels is very important. We also have some relationships in Spain, obviously, for um, sherry casks, but also for, for DHR, ECHR, STR casks. And Jim Swan worked very, very closely with a number of people to develop, um, you know, the, uh, the STR strip toasted re, uh, rechar casks. And so, yeah, we use people regularly to, to give us our specification, if you like. And then in terms of um, like barley, uh, where do you guys get your barley from? So we, one of, the, one of the things people always ask us, you know, do you use Welsh barley? And we have used Welsh barley. We've got some Welsh barley um, in, you know, distilled whiskey in stock. But in truth, if you ever come to Wales, you, you'll quickly realize that we don't get an awful lot of sunshine. Um, it's, um, um, I can see today, is, although it's still quite dark, it's going to be a fairly gloomy day again. Um, and um, so we don't get the sunshine hours. So, so most of the barley we use is from the east coast of the UK. And it comes through people like um, Beds and Muntins, who are the, um, the malt, uh, big malt companies. And they give us a, I mean, the variety, the variety of barley will change from time to time. It's really for us about the chemistry um, of the barley, making sure that it's um, you know, correct in terms of being low nitrogen and also having the right um, specification to, to give us the yield that we want um, so you know we're very we have a very um, tight specification on barley but it doesn't it's not fixed on one particular uh, variety uh, but we you know we have we have a number of suppliers who know exactly what we want and, and, and we work closely with them and you know you get varieties you, you get sort of variations year on year because of um, harvests and, and crops but it, it's so far it's worked it's worked very well for us don't forget in the early days with Pandaren we didn't used to do that. We used to get a company, uh, an old brewer from Wales, uh, from Cardiff, capital city of Wales, uh, called Brains. Brains Brewery used to make the wash for us. Uh, and they used to do it. They used to do it with a um, brewer's barley and with, with their own brewer's yeast. Uh, for a long time, that's what we used because we didn't have the resources to do it ourselves. Then when we put our own mash tun in, uh, we changed and we moved everything towards um, distillers barley and, and a couple of different types of distillers yeast and then those little changes are, have no doubt helped us to, to just little incremental bits of improvement as we as we went along um, so we you know we've made a lot of changes I think over the last probably seven or eight years that have contributed to um, an improvement in the I mean people say to me these days wow Pendaren has improved so much over the last few years um, honestly I don't see that much I think it's been pretty consistent over the years but the perception is that it's gotten an awful lot better and, I, and i'm very happy with that yeah, yeah um phil will like know is it two two row barley that you guys are using um <clears throat> the, the last no the last uh, the, the current strain of barley we're using is um uh lorette i think um but we've used a number of different different types to be honest and as i say that you won't i don't think you'll see too much as long as it's got the right chem chemical specific you know the chemistry is right on it you won't notice any, uh, too much variation the emphasis for us is based on the two different types of yeast that we use and the length of fermentation which is really important where we do a three-day fermentation which is you know is important for us but also in the uh, we were talking with sam earlier today and with joshua um extracting the um, the wash out of the mash tun, um, the clarity of the wash is really important, that we don't extract the, the wash and put it into the fermenters until we have a really clear, crystal clear liquid. 
And what we've learned, I mean, again, working with Dr. Swan is that um, getting that crystal clear liquid is really important to formation of fruity flavor. Totally. So there's different aspects to it that uh, where we, we feel that there is, you know, the importance in terms of getting the quality of the um, of the wash and the fermentation right. Right. Um, and so, you know, you guys kind of have almost two two flagship lines between, you know, the, your Dragon series and then, you know, the Gold series. And, yeah. um, you know, we're just curious if you could talk about some of the tasting notes and differences between the two that um you know that come with each line yeah well uh, if you bear with me let me just take you through a couple of things about because i'm not i'm conscious i haven't answered your question about the female distilling team yet so let me get to that it's okay I, so there's no the, real structure here i'm just trying to keep that conversation I mean, moving forward yeah no no, no I'm, I'm i'm very relaxed with that that's great so here's jim i'm sure you're familiar with with him i mean one of the you know one of the wonderful things about working with jim was he would um come to a show, whether it was the New York um, Whiskey Fest or uh, in Philadelphia, anywhere. And he would, although he was kind of a consultant to the business, he would have no trouble in pulling on a Pendarin shirt and being part of the brand. Uh, and of course, he didn't just do that for us. He worked very closely with Cavalan and he worked with Milk and Honey and, and a few other distilleries. But uh, he was a real team player, you know, in terms of what he did. And one, and one of the legacy things which you mentioned, and we, we got here eventually, um, is our, our our female distilling team. Um, and we started off actually the first lady distiller who worked for us, uh, Gillian, um, is now with Glen Morangy and has been with Glen Morangy for a number of years. Um, but when uh, Gillian left uh, and Jim wanted to recruit replacements, you know, it was all about finding people with the nose, getting the right nose for the job. And uh, he had these very structured uh, nose and, and, and taste tests, uh, which was which was really good. And uh, Laura on the on the left and Eister on the right were the two people who came out of that sort of recruitment. And you know, when I look back now, and they had a six-year apprenticeship with uh, with Dr. Swan, and we were so lucky um, that that uh, they had that time with him because. Uh, you know, it really, it, he, he didn't work full time, you know, he would come back and forth every month, we saw him at least once a month. Um, but, he, you know, the knowledge that he imparted to the two ladies, and they both got a chemistry background. So they had the sort of um, a good background to start off with. They passed the nose test with flying colours, they had the top marks in, the, in what was a competitive process for, uh, you know, the interview, um, uh, in terms of sensory perception. So, so we, you know, the legacy that Jim has left us there is, is, is astonishing. When it came to recruiting the lady in the middle, Bethan, who was um, training with the other, the other girls, um, I think we had it in our mind. We were, we were going to take, I don't think I've told Bethan this, but we, we were going to take a guy so we could balance it up. But at the end of the day, you, you take the outstanding candidate. And, and she, same as the other ladies, passed, you know, the nose test of flying colours and was undoubtedly the, the outstanding person for the job. So we employ on the basis of who's the best person for the job. And, you know, we have a, a, a female team, um, but there's no doubt that it that has attracted attention because it's a, I wouldn't say it's unique in the industry by any terms, but it, but it's unusual perhaps to have such a, you know, just the team as it is, but they, they work very independently. You know, um, Laura runs the distillery, Eister is the, is the blender and um, Bethan uh, works between the two. Um, and um, they, they, they have, a, they're a great team. You know, they, they prove, What's been very nice for us, <clears throat> excuse me, what's been very nice for us is since we lost Jim, um, we haven't missed a beat in terms of being able to produce whiskies that are award winning and have had great critical acclaim. We, we've, we've, we've not really, you know, and it's, a, it's really a testament to Jim's skills at developing our people on that, you know, you wouldn't know. And, and that's been fantastic. That's been, been a great legacy. Very cool. Uh, yeah, so we got to the answer. We just, you know, we had to that. take a little bit of that that roundabout way to to get there. Um, yeah. So, and that and that's awesome. And, and you're right. I think it's it's uh, something that when you talk about the industry, like somebody that I think of when it comes to female leadership is like Joy Spence from Appleton. You know, she's doing this amazing, incredible job. But yeah, hearing it's like the whole team is female. It's like, oh, that's rad. Like that's super cool. I mean, and honestly, it's for for me, it becomes a selling point. You know. And um, people really want to get behind brands like that, that, you know, not only is it unique because it's from Wales, but the whole team, you know, female team, the still, all these different factors really come together to create this really 
fun and interesting lineup that, you know, again, I mean, I, I feel like every few weeks I get another email from Sam. It's like, guess who won more awards? Penn Barrett, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's really cool to, to be involved with a, with a brand like that. So if we could, well, we'll go back. No, go if ahead. I may say, yeah, yeah, sorry. The other nice thing about it is that, you know, I feel that our style of whiskey um, being light, fruity, delicate, uh, even with our PT whiskeys, they're not heavily, you know, they're not, they're not like an Isla whiskey. They're much lighter in style. And this would appear to suit a, um, a wider palate range than, than maybe some other whiskeys. And it does seem to be accessible to female drinkers and to younger drinkers and maybe to people who are new to the category. So um, the combination of, you know, seeing a younger female distilling team plus the style of the whiskey, I think, is, I mean, that does work really well for us. Yeah, and I and I think that's also definitely a way that that I kind of go through it. I mean, especially with like the Dragon series compared to the Gold, it's like you know, like these ones are really going to kind of are going to knock on the door for you, and then and then these other ones are you know probably going to knock a little harder, potentially kick in the door when it comes yeah. to to the palate. So, can you speak a little oh. bit to the differences between those lines? Okay, I'm Drew. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I've one more. <laughs> there's one more thing I would like to do before we do that. All right, we'll, let's do it. We'll, 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 we'll start to talk a bit more ugly now, you know, we'll, we'll talk Jim Murray. Um, he, he, he won't mind me saying that, I'm sure. Um, so I, I'd just like to say in terms of people, you know, uh, talk a little bit about the people within our business. But working with people like Jim has been very, very good for us. And, you know, you know, and I know that Jim can, you know, um, divide opinion. Um, he can be very controversial. Um, but what I found is, you know, over the years, working working with jim and putting it out there um with with jim has been terrific uh, I, I like working with him because you never know what he's going to say um but i feel we are confident enough now that you know we would we would ride the knocks with someone like jim um because most of the time he likes what we do most of the time he's he, you know he's been very supportive uh and you know if he doesn't like something then he you know, makes it known but but we like working with people like that where we can really have healthy debate and, and get you know get get the passion sort of moving really so i would say that someone like jim's been very important in um you know in terms of um uh, building awareness of the brand and, and as you can see from some of these quotes you know he because he's a journalist by by background he's eminently quotable as well so um you know you get things that, you know um perfectly wonderfully and uniquely welsh um, you know, if all the world's, world's whiskies were this good, I'd never be able to get close to finishing the Bible. You know, there's some nice compliments in, in there. And when you think um, that um, some of our whiskies uh, have achieved 95, 95 and a half marks, 96, 96 and a half marks, and this is for things like Pendarian Legend and Pendarian Celt and Madeira Finish, you know, it's not just for the special whiskies. And then when you think that the highest mark he's ever given to any whiskey is 97 and a half marks out of 100. And things like legend are, are just two, two or three marks away from that. that. That pleases me because, you know, it's for me, it's about, it's not about making one whiskey, which is oh, top marks. It's about consistency. It's about keeping it, you know, keeping the standard high all the way through our, our, our production. So that's, that's been kind of useful. And, and you mentioned the awards. I mean, I've got a list if any of the guys need, need um, a list of the awards. Very pleasing to be um, winning awards in the San Francisco competition, you know, because that's very relevant for you guys. Um, so, I'm, I'm, you know, I think that's good. And part of that comes out of, you know, the work that Eister and uh, Laura and Bethan are doing. Part of it comes out of, you know, effectively using the pot still spirit that I mentioned earlier. There's a number of things that are coming together there that help us to win awards in the UK, win awards in, in the US. Um, and uh, just a couple of quick pictures just to, uh, so there's Jim, Jim Swan, Jim Murray with myself and His Royal Highness Prince Charles. That's back in 2008, that's a few years ago now, uh, when we managed to get Prince Charles to drink a cask strength whiskey um, just before he was giving a speech to the Welsh government. And um, <laughs> after he drank it, he looked at me and said, how strong was that? And it, was, it was about 58%. Um, so, and he said, well, you, you could have told me that before I drank it. Um, <laughs> got a speech to make. But uh, no, he was very good. I mean, he was very su supportive to us. And, um, um, and again, before we get on to the, we'll get on to legend now and that sort of stuff. Um, I only show this picture because I can, 
because uh, as, as, as many of you hopefully know, Catherine Zeta Jones isn't American. Uh, she is from Swansea. She's a, she's a Welsh lady. And uh, this picture was taken in the Yale Club in New York uh, for St. David's Day a few years ago. Uh, the lady on the far right is Sean Whitelock, who some of you guys know is our brand director. And the guy on the far left is Edward Minning, who's a um, veteran of the drinks industry. And he used to run Monsieur Henri Fine Wines um, in, uh, in America and great guy. Right, so I, just, I, I only put that in because I can, to be honest. And uh, well, well, it's you know it's funny because I actually do have a question in regards to the Prince Charles picture. So oh, okay. um, my my wife is I don't know why, but just loves the royal family. Like it's just she's one of those Americans, and it doesn't make any sense to me. We have a group of friends that they all just talk about it all the time. They try to explain it to me. I still don't get it. And I showed her the picture. I was like, "Hey, this is the guy that I'm talking to tonight." Look who yeah. else is in this picture. She, she lost her mind. So oh, really? I, I do have to ask, like, what is it like to hang out with a member of the royal family? Like, is there any special background check that you had to go through in order to make that happen? Because you look pretty close to him, and I don't see anybody, you know, any bodyguards, like, at least in that picture. Well, on that particular day, I had the, I had the, 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 the pleasure of showing him around the distillery. And, and of course, he, he, he likes, I mean, he, he's quite knowledgeable on, on single malt whiskey. He was educated in, in Scotland. And uh, he likes, you know, he's got a, a number of, I think, favorite single malts. Um, but he was great. I mean, you know, whatever you think, you know, in terms of the royal family, the guy works incredibly hard for business in the UK and business in Wales. And uh, I've, I've been in this company four or five times because we're Welsh. We're, we're a sort of Welsh brand. We're a premium Welsh brand. And there's not many premium Welsh brands out, out there, really. And so I've been fortunate to sort of, you know, uh, be in that position. And um, yeah, the guy just works really hard for, for, for businesses like us. And, and if you can't knock that, you know, I think that's yeah. great. So, um, but no, we had, to, we had the sort of secret um, service team around the day before to check out the distillery. And the, they were hanging out in the woods behind the, uh, uh, the back of the distillery, make sure everything was safe. Um, but it, but he, has a, he actually has a house not, not that far from, from the distillery. He comes to Wales at least for a week every year. Oh, um, cool. Please tell your good lady he was he's a, he's a gentleman. I, I will, she's going to be very excited to hear that. So very yes. cool. So in terms of going back to um, catching up with your questions, um, so we have two we have two um, series of whiskies. We have the Legend series and we have the Gold series. And um, um, the Legend series is kind of I suppose it's the entry point to to our our brands. Um, Penderyn Legend is a Madeira finished whiskey, which is in our house style, as we've already said. And it's a light, very light Madeira finish. Uh, that's our best selling whiskey in France, by the way. And uh, it's drunk as an aperitif whiskey, probably in France, because of the lightness of the spirit. Uh, and actually, in the UK, it's bottled at 41% alcohol, whereas for you guys, we bottle at 43. So it's a little bit, that gives it a bit more, I suppose, body to it just by having a bit more alcohol. Um, Pandarian Celt, we've talked a little bit about PT barrel finish peatiness. Um, compared to the, um, um, the uh, smoky whiskey in, in, the, in the gold range, Pandarian Celt is the smokiest thing that we do. You know, I, I think I said to people earlier, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're an Ardbeg drinker, if you drink Ardbeg for, Ardbeg for breakfast, you're not really going um, to get the peatiness in our whiskey. It's much more subtle, it's a bit lighter. But a lot of people seem to like that, you know, if, they, if they're not really he into heavy PT whiskies, ours is, is, I think, is an option. And then for Penderyn Myth, which is kind of made from bourbon barrels and rejuvenated wine casks, um, a lot of this work that Jim Swan did on Dichar Richar, which was really, really valuable to us, that's more, again, on the fruity side of things and, um, you know, gives a bit of creamy toffee fudge as well. So we've got three whiskies there, which are light, easy, accessible, and um, price point wise, because they're a bit lower in alcohol, they, they, you know, that makes it a little, little better as well. In the UK, they would be uh, the whiskies that would be in the supermarkets. They'd be the, the main, you know, that would be the first point of contact that a lot of people would probably have with, with the brand. Um, and then I, I would suggest that, you know, partly because of the 46% um, alcohol and partly because of the, the, the presentation, that the gold series is slightly more premium. Um, 
And, um, you know, within that range, again, we have, there are some parallels in, in the ranges, but the whiskies are all casked separately. They're all prepared separately and they all have a slightly different um, uh, barrel blend, if you like. I don't like using the word blend. Let's, let's, let's say we're marrying the whiskies together, but something to understand with Pendarian is, you know, that the, um, the whiskies are, you know, every barrel is individually nosed and tasted and every barrel is individually scored. Uh, so when it comes to putting these together, the, the barrels have had a lot of attention before they get to the stage of, of marrying them and putting them together. Um, and then in terms of age, because we haven't talked about age, you know, we don't carry age statements. We don't believe that age statements are, are, are in any way the most important thing. But what I would say is, I mean, in general terms, things like the port would, um, would probably lie in the cask longer than the Madeira finish. Um, but that's because we just feel that it, it, you know the, the outcome is better. You know, it is it, it the port is you know needs to be a little bit older to be um, at the standard we want. Um, but there's quite a lot of variability. You know, it, it really comes down to individual um, batches and individual judgments. How many casts do you guys currently have filled right now? Uh, it's around about twelve thousand casks in the warehouse. Um, we've got three. We've got three warehouse sites. Um, and um, uh, yeah, we, I mean, we've been, we started, as I mentioned earlier, at one barrel of whiskey a day, uh, which doesn't give you a lot of stock. You know, you've got 300 barrels a year, uh, but we've been campaigning 24 seven for the last five years now. We've been putting a lot of whiskey into stock, but that basically means that the, the age profile is a little bit skewed. You know, we don't have a massive stock of older whiskies. We have whiskies up to nearly 20 years old, but we don't have a huge stock of them. Um, so we are, but we are working on that and we're trying, as we build uh, the business, we're also trying to build the, keep building the age profile. That's an incredibly difficult thing to do when you're um, building a business and, you know, you have that trade off between you want to grow the business, but you also want to grow the profile on the stock as well. And we're trying to do a bit of both really. And then I, I believe you touched on this earlier, but um, one of our guys wants to know uh, what style of port you guys were using for for that expression because he gets a lot of people that say it's different than what they expect kind of like a funkiness to the port expression yeah it's um we, we in on the, in the main we're using ruby port uh, barrels for um for, for the port expression um in the main i would say um <clears throat> yeah i mean it's it's a combination of the port barrels and again the interaction with our spirit which i think makes it a bit different i mean the sherry wood you've got there which we use all are also sherry casks. Um, when we first did the sherry uh, bottling, it was 100% all are also sherry, but 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 it was just too much sherry and not enough. You didn't get the interplay with the with the malt and you know with, with the, you didn't, just didn't get a balance to it. So now that's probably I think uh, about 70% bourbon, 30% sherry. I mean it it varies from batch to batch, um, but we've developed a um, you know, a, an, an approach over the years, uh, which gives us, you know, consistency um, that your average consumer wouldn't not notice the difference, but somebody who is a bit more, um, pays a bit more attention, you would notice the, you know, differences from batch to batch. I, I think that's inevitable when you're a, a relatively small distillery. And, and I think it should be celebrated as much as anything. But, you know, we, we do look for uh, you know, a fair amount of consistency where we can get it. And then I, I know you said that with your guys' current production runs and stuff like that, there doesn't leave a whole lot of room for experimentation, but are there any casks that are resting right now that you in particular are excited about to, for them to come out that maybe we're not, that we haven't seen yet? Yeah. I mean, I, I think in terms of experimentation, one of the things that, that is nice um, for us is, yeah. I mean, a lot of the creativity is with the wood. Um, so we have, a, we, we've, and I've been very lucky um, the guys um, working on the site. So I don't know if you've come across Jan Giancarlo, Giancarlo Bianchi, who's um, one of our, our directors. And of course with Eister as well, our blender, we've been able to go out and buy a lot of barrels over the last few years and, and sometimes small batches, sometimes, you know, one or two of this and that. We've got quite a lot of specials in the warehouse, um, which I'm really excited about uh, coming up. Um, you know, they range from Australian wine casks to maybe some rum barrels um, to some some French wine casks. 
Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff there, which will come out in very, very small batches. And, and I've no doubt, you know, Sam will be one of the first people who will be getting a choice on that, um, you know, which reflects our relationship with you guys. We want you guys to have, you know, the, the cutting edge of what we've got, you know, and we want the US to be uh, the biggest market in the world for us. You know, at the moment, France is probably the biggest in the world and we love that. We, we love the French market, but, um, you know, we haven't had a partner in the US until the last few years who could really do justice for us. And now we have. We're determined to make the most of it. So you'll be seeing uh, a, a number of specials coming out, which would be quite exciting, I think. Very cool. I, I definitely know there's a few people on this on this call right now that are going to be very excited about those. Um, and yeah, we'll definitely pass France eventually. I mean, we don't we don't have a history of losing to those guys. So yeah. um, you know, we'll, uh, we'll nobody that out. has a history to losing to those guys. Nobody. <laughs> um, so. Now, sorry, Robert just like threw me off on what I was going to ask you right there. So great job, Dean. Okay, well, can I let me let me go on? I mean, just talking about that. Yeah, obviously we. Go on. I mean, you're you know, I, I don't. Um, I know I know you're you're putting this out on on YouTube or whatever. I saw some of your previous videos which I enjoyed listening to them uh, yesterday. You're the um, one guy. Yes, I, I, that's I, awesome. I, I subscribe. <laughs> uh, no, um. You know, one of the things um, for us is, I mean, Sam has been quite vocal in terms of getting some age statements on some of our tasks um, for the US market, which is something that we are prepared to do for you guys, but it isn't something we do as a general rule, you know? So, um, you know, we'll, we'll do, we, we don't believe that that's for us as a, as a business is the most important thing, but we understand that, you know, the local market like, likes to see some of this stuff. So I think, you know, in terms of these single casks, yeah, we're going to, we're going to, really push um, a lot of interest in the brand through the single cask business over the next few years. I think that's very important. Yeah, for sure. I, and yeah, I think that's something that we really get excited about, you know, cause you build up these, these loyalties and stuff and you just kind of like, Hey, I know you really like this expression. You got to try it, you know, in yeah. this form. So I know I'm definitely yeah. excited about that as well. And on, on the screen now you'll see, I mean, obviously the USA, we had a 12 year old cask that came to you guys. <clears throat> excuse me we did one for whiskey Light paris last year uh, and i only went to the trade day which is the third day of the show and by the time i got there it had gone and everybody was telling me how great it was and how I, I, you know they wanted to sit down and have a drink with me and, and taste it but it had all gone by the time i got I got to the paris show um and the other interesting one there is that is harrods you know harrods are um, you know, exclusive knightsbridge store in london and you know they sell um, some of our um, single cast whiskies. Uh, I guess it must be eight hundred dollars a bottle, um, which really showcases the. Uh, you know, uh, he's he's actually picked a number of um, bourbon only maturations and some Madeira casks. So you know that's really interesting. Some of the some of the the, the, the high end casks that we do, um, and the exposure that they that they get into customers who, uh, you know, obviously look for. And, and our sophisticated really want to, to, to see the, the best stuff we've got from the distillery. So this is an exciting element, uh, end of the business that we're, we're constantly developing. Very cool. And is that, um, I know like one of the awards that you guys had got, um, or one of the, it was in Jim Murray's Whiskey Bible for, I wanna say it was a single cast expression that went to Germany. Yeah, was, that's right, yeah. Yeah, and so was that just like a retailer picking a barrel? It was, yeah, it was, um, our importer in Germany are called uh, Schlumberger and uh, you know they they asked for some options and we they selected this particular um, rich Madeira cask and uh, that was the Jim Murray's European whiskey of the year for the 2020 Bible yeah. the third time that we've won that award which is really pleasing um, and yeah I mean of course the only problem is with something like that by the time Jim's book has come out the whiskey's mostly been sold. Right. So it's yeah. a bit of a frustra frustration for everyone, really, you know. Yeah. Um, so may I just, let me just give you a little bit more on the, the sort of passion and celebration um, in terms of Wales. Um, I mean, I don't know, you may recognize some of the faces on this little um, matrix of, of stories. I mean, we, we, you know, we love to tell people about Wales because um, we like to own Wales as, as a whiskey, you know, and 
people have heard of the Prince of Wales, but they haven't necessarily heard that much about Wales. You know, they don't necessarily know that we have more castles per square mile than any other country. You know, we, we have a lot of uh, a lot of heritage and history. And then you've got people like uh, Sir Tom Jones, who comes from Wales, or Shirley Bassey, or um, Matthew Rees, who's, uh, you know, I know that uh, Joshua Hatton's done some some work with him. He interviewed him recently. Mm -hmm. Um, so we feel we've got a, you know, a lot of good stories to tell. And one of the nice things about the business is this sort of design element of, and this is a whiskey that we, um, we did to celebrate. This isn't available in the States at the moment, but uh, to, to celebrate the poet Dylan Thomas, where you, you know, we Welsh poet uh, used to spend a lot of time in New York um, reciting poems and packing out houses in the 1950s. A real rock and roll sort of guy before rock and roll existed and died in New York, unfortunately. Um, but we love to tell these kind of stories, you know, and um, rugby. I mean, you know, you probably don't, you guys don't play so much rugby. Um, uh, but, um, you know, we, we, we like to tell stories about it, which is our national sport. So we've got some nice design stuff to celebrate that. Um, and then opera, this guy, Sabrin Terraville. Um, is a very world famous opera star from Wales, big malt whiskey fan. Designed a bottle to uh, for him, which is a, you know again ah, red flag. Sorry, I just saw red flag, uh, which is the first in the series. Um, so um, yeah, thank you for that. So yeah, we, so we love to tell stories, you know. And the latest one from the distillery is about a lady called Rhiannon, which is a very old Welsh story from a book of tales called the Mabinogion. Um, so yeah, we've got a there's a lot of interesting stuff that comes out and we try, you know, we want to try and get some of this into the U S market as, as we go. Um, so yeah, we, we would we would love to tell you, um, you know, a lot more about Wales and, 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 uh, do that through, through our whiskey. Yeah. The, that's actually kind of funny that you bring that stuff up because it actually was my next question. And, um, you guys did a bottle for Warren Gatlin and you called yeah. it the uh, Gatastic, and yeah. so he is a legend in in the rugby world. And so I was, you know, I, and you're right, we don't watch rugby over here. So I had to do, I had to dive into rugby today as well. But uh, yeah. yeah, that bottle was awesome. That bright red, you know, color was uh, was something that just really, really popped. And I, and so my question was going to be, you know, what other Welsh legends are are you looking to do bottles for like is there anything you can talk about yet or um you know is there like a personal preference say like oh man i'd really like to have a christian bale uh bottle at one point or is there anything like that um yeah i mean the, the thing is there's there's a, there's a there's a lot of contenders um for that let me just show you um as you've mentioned it hold on uh here we go uh, there we go. So can you see that? So that's there's there's War, for those who don't know, there's Warren Gatland uh, with his, his bottle of Gatastic with um, the designer Glenn Tetzel and uh, John John Tregenner, our media guy. Uh, that was that was just uh, Warren Gatland had run Welsh rugby for um, it must be ten years, uh, taking us through a number of tournaments, and it was just a little thank you. There was nothing commercial about it at all. Uh, but uh, it was a kind of a thank you from the, the rugby loving people, um, you know, just before they went off to the World Cup. So that was quite nice. Yeah, and there, you guys actually put a quote from him on that bottle, which I thought was super rad. And it was just like, you know, you have two really good teams. It's just our team has forgotten how to lose. And I was just like, yeah. that is so cool. And what an awesome thing to have, you know, imprinted onto a bottle forever. So when you do something like that, I mean, was that just, is that just strictly a one-off or was that something that people could buy? No, that actually was um, uh, a, a very much a one-off. Um, it was something that uh, uh, we made 30 bottles and uh, we gave, um, uh, we actually gave a couple of cases to Warren and we've um, distributed a few just for, you know, um, maybe for competitions or something like that, but you can't buy it. Um, you can't buy it at all. But Wales won a rugby grand slam in 2019. And so there was an associated bottle of whiskey for to celebrate the grand slam that people could buy, nice. uh, which was a souvenir edition. Uh, yeah, yeah. But that only sells, we don't sell too many of those to our English friends. They only, only tend to get bought in. <laughs> well, I mean, I, you know, I, I think that's been one of the fun things about taking these plunges 
on these happy hours is I, you know, finding all these one-offs. And I'm like, oh man, I mean, I have no idea who this guy was yesterday or, you know, a couple of days ago. And now all the thing I wanted the Gastastic in my collection, because that's just such a, that's such a great name. And um, I think, I think going forward, yeah, we've got a number of um, um, things, things and people on the agenda to celebrate in our Icons of Wales series. So um, uh, I probably couldn't, tell you yet what they are because they're still in the uh shana still got them under under uh, design lock and key right um, but it won't necessarily you know, it's not just about celebrity it's about it's about telling stories it's about uh, it's about um you know it could be to do with the landscape it could be to do with the castle history it could be to do with could be to do with personality but it's a bit of everything you know. Right. Well, and I think that's really the business that we're in, especially considering the brands that we work with. You know, it, it is about telling those stories. And, you know, and, and if you are a bartender or anything like that, and you're sitting at a bar like, you know, yeah, let's drink this. And, and here's, you know, the reasons why I get to tell that cool story. So um, yes. I, I am going to shift, you know, shift gears on you a little bit. Uh, when we were first emailing, I, had, I you know, I said like, yeah, you know, I want to have you on here. And, and you are totally fine with the, with the time frame. And I was like, okay that's going to be like three in the morning. But then you replied with, I have a small baby, so I don't sleep anyways. Yeah, and I was yeah. like, okay, I have a two year old. So I know exactly what he means by that. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, people in your position, I, I'm just always curious, you know, what is that work life balance like where you're, you know, you obviously a small child is extremely demanding. Also running, you know, one of the, um, you know, fastest growing whiskey companies is also extremely demanding and just kind of how you're able to, divvy up your time between hanging yeah. out with Prince Charles and then seeing the kid and you know at home like you know, all these different yeah. fun things that go into it yeah I mean this is the worst possible time to have a child when the whole country is locked down and uh, uh, the funniest thing was okay so we've got a, we've got a two-year-old as well and and and, um, and I said when 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 Mac, Max and our, our two-year-old was born we had bought you know you buy everything for them and then um, everybody comes along and gives you presents and we got all this stuff. Uh, and so I said, I said to Laura, let's not do that this time. Let's not buy too much because, because people are going to come along and, and, you know, give us gifts and all that sort of thing. And, and, and nobody's come to see us because they're not allowed. So <laughs> we're, we're all sat here thinking, this isn't, this isn't what we imagine. Yeah. It's, it's difficult. I mean, it's, it's always been difficult as you know, you know, when you when you're in business, when you're traveling a lot. Um, I think, you know, the, the one thing is you, it's a curse and an advantage that you can work anywhere. So, you know, um, you can work at home, so you can be at home, but then you never quite switch off. So, you know, I always think, yeah, it's a bit of a struggle. And especially when you've got an international business where people want you up at three in the morning or, or, they, or, or they, you know, they, they're starting to work when you're going to start to relax. But, I, you know, I, I, I enjoy it. And, and, uh, but keeping the balance is difficult. And we all understand that. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's increasingly difficult when you've got so many ways of, of communicating with people as well, but it goes with the territory, I think, you know, so, uh, you know, if you enjoy what you do and I think we, we're very, we're all very lucky to, to be in an industry where, you know, um, it's a, it's a nice industry to be in, you know, I mean, uh, as much as I love the steel industry, it was a lot hotter and smellier and dustier and, you know, um, you know, this is kind of different. So I, I'm, I certainly am not complaining. Uh, yeah. Um, and then to kind of continue to dive more into you. So I, I've also read that, you know, you're, you're a big time music fan and some of your favorite, um, artists are Richard Thompson, um, said Green Gartside, Elvis Costello, yeah. like really heavy lyric based, uh, musicians. And yeah. so this is a two part question. The first is now, is there anybody today, modern musicians that you think are impressive and, you know, really, really great with the, the lyrics and everything like that? And then also who makes the best whiskey drinking music? <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Um, okay. Who makes the, well, let's start, let's deal with that first. The best whiskey drinking music. Um, I, well, I think, you know, I mean, do you know Richard Tom? Have you come across Richard Thompson? I mean, he's quite. Uh, I looked. Yeah, I actually had to. Uh, again, like I've kind of taken all these weird rabbit holes yeah. today, like going down and listening to different things. I mean, I, you know, he's he's. Um, I mean, he he turned seventy uh, last year, and packed out the Royal Albert Hall in London as his birthday sort of thing, and uh, so he's a bit. You know, I, I missed. I was a bit young when his music first came out, 
but I found his lyrics and his um, his music uh, to be ideal for sitting down and drink sipping whiskey and uh, and listening to some of the just wonderful melodies and lyrics and guitar solos because he's a very very good guitarist and he's been doing concerts in lockdown situation as well you know there's been streaming this stuff from his living room That's cool. you, can get, you can get up close and see the see the fingers and everything which would, would be helpful if i was a half decent guitarist but i'm not so it's wasted <laughs> um but i think um ron sexsmith is another one i think uh, do you know ron sexsmith he's a canadian singer songwriter who's been i do not know yeah, he's well he's terrific i mean he he writes um some of the most unusual um he's got some of the most unusual melodies and melodic sort of directions in his music so he's good um i could you know most of the people i'm going to mention you're all going to go what who really you know but um, i think that's but that's like kind of like the nice thing about these um like these happy hours is i've been exposed to so many different walks of life you know over the past month and a half i think is where we're at and uh, it's cool. It's cool to hear these things. Like I write them down. I'm like, all right, there's another one I gotta go check out. And there's just been a lot of um, cool things that have been introduced to my life. So I love, I love this kind of stuff. Like, you know, cause I mean, the reality is, is that you, you, when you do a lot of these whiskey interviews and stuff like that, you know, you're going to get those standard questions all the time. And, you know, I want people to kind of feel like, okay, yeah, let's learn something about whiskey, but then let's also learn something about these people that's behind them and actually develop some real relationships and kind of get that escapism from this whole pandemic that we're all living in right now, you know? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, one of the, the, only, the only highlight, the only redeeming feature of this whole episode for me has been the ability to listen to some of these people online and, and listen to some of the concerts that they, they give in because, of course, they can't ply their trade. They can't, they can't go out and, and you can tell that they're all, they're all missing it, you know, they're all, because these people are not, they're not people who fill stadiums or are, you know, necessarily the most famous or most successful musician, but they're jobbing, you know, they're real musicians. And uh, I think it's terrible that they can't go out and do what they do, but, they, but they're giving up their time and, uh, and, and broadcasting for the benefit of the rest of us, which is, you know, very, very nice, um, I think. One of the things about Pandaren, which has been um, interesting, is we've, and John Tregenna, our media guy, um, helped us to create this, but we, we, have a, a, we have a music book prize, the Pandarian Prize for Music Literature. Um, strangely, there was, no, there was no prize, there was no um, actual prize for music literature uh, in the publishing world. And so once a year, we um, create a shortlist and we um, present a prize for the best book about, it could be a band or a singer, um, musician or whatever. And that's been, that's been really great because that, um, uh, we work with a guy called Richard Thomas, who is a, a guy who's been a, a rock and pop promoter in the UK for many, many years. And, uh, you know, you suddenly have conversations about Pandaren when you're talking about people like Elvis Costello or Bruce Springsteen or um, Ray Davis of the Kinks. You know, these guys will write books and they will publicize their books and go to things that they wouldn't normally do if they were just talking about their music because they play in big stadiums and, and all the rest of it. So uh, the Pandarian Book Prize has been quite nice to, to actually get into um, a side of music, which uh, again, it's just a different direction. You know, it doesn't suit necessarily all of our Pandarian followers, but it's another strand uh, of, of cultural interest, I suppose. Yeah, well, I think that was one thing that um, when John came over to California, I, I want to say maybe it was two years ago now, I yeah. have no concept for time anymore, but, um, it, it was talking about how, how proud, you know, the people of, of Wales are. And then now it's like, you know, when you're Welsh, like we, we tell you that we're Welsh, you know, we don't let you, you know, just find out. It's like, it's, it is that point of pride. And, um, yeah. for, for my final question, and then, you know, we can open up to everybody else, but, um, uh, and you can actually add somebody else in it. Cause I don't know all of the players in this arena, but who is the best Welsh actor? Is it Christian Bale, Sir Anthony Hopkins, Timothy Dalton, or Matthew Reese? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, well, because he's from Port Talbot, um, I think Sir Anthony Hopkins would probably get, um, my, but then Matthew Reese hasn't been going long enough yet. I think Matthew will eclipse him over a period of time. Um, but, but Anthony Hopkins, who unfortunately, of course, doesn't drink anymore because um, 
you know, I think he struggled a little bit with it, but, uh, but he's from my hometown. Uh, but you, you didn't put Richard Burton on the list either. So, um, but that's probably going back too far, you know. Well, I, I, you know, I, there's, I got my limitations too. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, <laughs> we're very lucky. We, you know, we, we, we've got a, we have a, you know, there's a number of, a number of people you could, you could, you know, put in that, uh, on, on that category. So yeah. Yeah. I have, I have one other thing I'd like to share with you before we go to any questions and I'll be very quick. And that's no, just that we, yeah, we've got go a plan. Thank you. We've got planned for two new distilleries and I'd just like to share with you a few images of the, the one we're currently building in Llandidno, which is in the north of Wales, uh, if I may. Um, so it's kind of, it's kind of crazy to think about, you know, you guys starting off with like a little tin hut and then now you're about to open three different spots like that, you know, or two more spots is pretty, pretty amazing. And actually does remind me um, in terms of like, you know, validation for what you've done. Cause Nick, now you're a little over 15 years into this. Like, what are those moments where you're kind of like, yep, I made the right decision. Like this, this was, you know, it was a risk back then, but now I know I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, yeah, I think um, oh, there, there've been, there've been many occasions where you kind of, you know, feel, I, I think when you get recognition and it doesn't mean, I don't mean necessarily winning awards or, but you know, you could be stood at a the stand and somebody comes along and, and they say, well, I've never tasted this before. Can you tell me a bit about it? And, the, and 20 minutes later, you can see the, the passion in, in their eyes. You know, that that's, that's the big kick, isn't it? That's the thing that you really get from, from this is that you people have connected with you and you know, they're going to take that away and they're not going to forget. Um, we had a guy a couple of years ago, a senior guy from the Scotch whiskey industry. Uh, and he came to, uh, we were in London and he came on the stand and I was stood with Dr. Jim Swan and uh, he said, uh, come on, I'd like to try your whiskey, you know, and I could see Jim was a bit apprehensive because he was you know, pretty senior in the industry and we were the new kids on the block. And we poured him a glass of whiskey and he started sipping it and he said, oh, could I have some water, please? And Jim said, no, no, don't, don't take any water. I just want you to sip it neat at the moment and, you know, we'll add some water in a minute. And so the conversation went on and he was sipping and talking, sipping and talking. And then all of a sudden he looked down and his glass was empty and he said, oh, I haven't got any whiskey to put my water in there. Wow, that was nice. And you know, a moment like that and you think oh, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty special. So, so for me, those are the kind of main, you know, when you connect with people and, you know, genuinely, and I'm not saying this to flatter, you know, meeting you guys, having a, having a company in the States who share our passion for, um, for building these things and doing these things is amazing because you don't know until you're in the position that I'm in, you don't know how, how rare companies like, like um, Impex are. You know, it is difficult to, to find people around the world who are passionate enough to take you on and big enough to get you around and enough of the country and, you know, have all those elements together. So, you know, things like that are very, very important to us. Very cool. All right. So on to the distillery. On to the distillery. So, um, so Llandidno is a, an old uh, Victorian seaside resort in the north part of Wales. And uh, we've selected this. This is the building as, as it looks at the moment. Uh, it's an old schoolhouse. Um, it's an uh, old, old um, uh, boys boarding school, I think. And uh, it's got a, a, the frontage is lovely. The back end is a, a little bit ugly. It's a little bit, it needs a little bit of work. Um, but it's got a big car park at the back, which is quite nice. And um, basically, we're going to be um, using the, the, the windows um, to be as visual as we can uh, on the front of the building. And then on the back of the building, we're building a, a big glass atrium to give it a much more modern feel. So it's a kind of combination of using the old style of the building, but also modernizing uh, as well and taking the best of the old and, and, and a bit of the new. So um, we're very excited about it. And um, whereas we get about 40,000 visitors at Pendaren each year, uh, I think in Llandidno we'll probably get about 100,000 visitors. And, and that's the point really, it's about growing the, the, the footprint of the brand uh, in a in a town which is one hour's drive from Manchester and one hour's drive from Liverpool, um, so we're kind of um, yeah we're very excited about uh, about that. And then once we've done that and we've bedded that in, we'll be looking at doing the uh, a third site in in Swansea, which is a, much closer to the existing location, but again much more on the on the main line in terms of train, in terms of uh, road, 
Um, and so this is all about, um, you know, broadening the business to, to attract more visitors, really. So that was it. Oh, uh, is there a second? Because um, I so now I think I remember one time John was talking about you could actually bottle your own whiskey at these places. Is that still a thing that you guys are doing? Yeah, yeah, you can do that at that Pendarium. We've got two, we, we normally got two selections in the distillery. You can come and do it um, and sign the label and uh, sign our register. Yeah, you can do that. That's a really cool experience. Uh, awesome. Uh, does anybody have any questions uh, for, for Stephen while we have him? Drew, I got I, if I, oh, go ahead. You know, do, do you think, are you going to be using the same um, bottle motif and, and with, with the new distillery that you currently use at Pendarin or will you, when the new, I see that you keep the Welsh gold on the side of the building. Are you going to go with the same format of everything or are you going to completely switch it up because it's going to be a new footprint? Um, I, I think, it, well, first of all, Chris, in terms of the, the style of the whiskey from the distillery, um, we're actually going to, for the first time, we're going, to, we're going to use a peaty barley and we're going to actually make a peaty whiskey in North Wales um, in the more, I suppose you could say, traditional way. So, so that'll be the, the first difference would be, you know, it's not going to be the same whiskies, it's going to be different whiskies. Um, in terms of the presentation and the style of branding, it'll all be under the Pendaren name. I can say that for sure. Um, but at this stage, I, I wouldn't say that it will necessarily be in the same presentation. Um, I think some of that is still, you know, some, some of that is still to be decided. Um, but each distillery will have its own unique style in terms of what it produces. And um, uh, we, have, we have some themes working uh, that we'll be, we'll be presenting on. So I think you'll see some, some different presentations coming out of those new distilleries. Awesome, thanks. Hey, Robert? Oh, oh he's gone. Hey, wait, he... Pizza man showed up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, does anybody else have any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Actually, uh, Stephen, you uh, answered that. Half of my question to Chris, answering to Chris, Chris's yeah. question, but uh, those two other locations that you guys are opening, uh, the bottling, the new bottling that are going to come out of it will mention their names of distilleries. So people, as you mentioned, there is going to be some different style of whiskey. So each bottle will have their names. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's very important um, because it will all be under the Pandaren name that you know which distillery the whiskey is coming from. So that, that'll be made ab absolutely clear on the, on the label, uh, whether it's come from Pendarin from Landidno or from Swansea. Uh, so I think that's, yeah, I think that's really important. And people, I agree that people will want to know uh, that that's the case. What about the stills? Are they gonna, you gonna keep the same stills as you have in the original distillery? Yeah, we're gonna use, we're gonna, we're gonna install one uh, Pendarin uh, Faraday still at each location. So we kind of feel that um, we've got enough of the uh, pot still spirit that we need going forward we would like to have more of the uh, of the pandarian style spirit available to us so uh, it'll be very much in the i guess the the, the, the classic spirit that we are already known for um so yes it'll, it'll be uh, the, the pandarian faraday stills one still at each location mm, okay good uh last question though has anthony hopkins ever visited you um <laughs> no not not the distillery because as i say he i don't think he's taken a drink for well at least 35 maybe 40 years um for, yeah. for what you know for whatever but well publicized reasons um he, actually he's his his um one of my neighbors um was his first cousin so he used to visit the, he used to visit the, the locality quite a lot uh come back a few years ago and um is very popular in, in, in our local town. But uh, no, in terms of Pendarian, unfortunately, because of the history, uh, it's something that I think he um, would, would want to stay clear of, which is a real shame. Well, if he ever calls you, you, you can refer with in California, so he can reach us. Well, well, actually, I have got, it's a personal story, but um, 
my father who passed away about six seven years ago had a stroke 20 years ago and um the day maybe a couple of days after he came out of hospital um because this guy um was a neighbor of ours was first cousin to anthony hopkins he actually got anthony to, to phone my dad to wish him well and uh he sat there one sunday morning the phone rings and uh it was just a couple of weeks before the oscar ceremony for the silence of the lambs and um you know i walk into the house and my dad's sitting there talking on the phone to anthony hopkins oh. um it's kind of i mean what a, what a lovely thing to do you know um uh, really really kind so um yeah uh, but, but unfortunately as i say he i'd like to thank i'd like to thank him with some with a bottle of whiskey but i don't think he would uh, he'd be keen to take it Maybe you can get him some hand sanitizer. Oh, I've got a great idea. <laughs> there you go. Um, uh, Robert, did you have a question? Yeah, it, it was a little bit of a comment. First of all, um, I'm, I, I've had the privilege of visiting you guys in Wales. And one thing I really wanted to emphasize that you, you touched on for everyone is I have visited distilleries in maybe 10 different countries. And, and I've never been anywhere that had such an emphasis, a pride of the, like, like patriotism and the historical context of Wales. I absolutely love that. And then I, I got a bottle from your gift shop that I think was about the 16 members who, who signed the Declaration of Independence in America. Yeah. And I love the, I love the concept tremendously. And I believe Mr. Filma stole it from me, the bottle. <laughs> um, no, I'm kidding. I gifted it to him. But uh, I actually think it would be amazing to come out with some kind of packaging like that for America because I don't think like like I told you I I just got tested and I'm I'm almost completely Welsh and I think a lot of Americans have that blood in them and I think it would be incredible to have a packaging that told that story especially now that you have a, a really good importer in America mm -hmm. to emphasize it and lastly, I wanted to apologize for my little celebrity joke that was meant to go private, but I've been drinking a bunch of these minis that you yourself gave me, so it's partially your fault. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> would you, would well, first you of all, it was... a little bit of that pride of the, of the Welsh that I just noticed from top to bottom while I was there, and, and any interest in doing some collaboration like that that tells that story? Yeah, do, do you know, I think it's, um, it's a strange thing with the Welsh that we, we tend to blend in sometimes in communities you know you don't see us congregating in groups like you see with the irish and maybe the scots i i don't know why that is i think it may be a lack of confidence sometimes um, but as you say when you get us on on our own terms in our own territory you you pick up on the the passion and the um you know the the pride that, that goes goes with it and i mean it was great to host you and when you came in you know and uh, we really enjoyed we really enjoyed that visit um, I, I think I 100% agree with you, and Sam and I should pick up the discussion. I think for something like you wouldn't take the you wouldn't take the whole Icons of Wales series, but something like Penderyn Independence, which celebrates the Welsh heritage in the U.S., I think is an I think it's a no-brainer. I think we should look to do that. Um, I think it's just about timing, really, Robert, and finding the right time to do it. In amongst the other things that we we've, we've been doing, I mean, it was very important to me that we got. A good range of whiskies into the states, and we have a now we have a fantastic range of the Dragon series and the Gold series. Really happy, happy with that. Um, but going forward, I think that that sort of thing is a you know very much for me is something that we should we should look at and see if it makes sense for um, for, for you guys. Yeah, I mean, let's say it wouldn't be everyone in the series, but it would be um, selectively done. Yeah, I think you guys do that one, and then you send me a bottle of the Gatastic, and we'll call it good. So. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it's an, an awesome idea. And again, forgive my sense of humor, but I am Welsh, you know. <laughs> 85%. Mr. Hon, to make sure that this bottle is in the good hands. Oh, there you go. There you go. There you go. And I'm sorry that you were giving mini share. When I was there, Stephen treated me with this. So, you know, it depends oh, how much man can, can what, drink. You know. What is going on? Why do I have this? Well, that's an entry <laughs> level of um, getting, you have to be introduced to that because you're not familiar with this brand. So sorry about that. Granny, <laughs> we're not 100% Welsh, as you know. I gave him extra five points because of his haircut. So, you know. <laughs> so let, let me, since I have your attention a little bit, want to just to first of all thank you, Stephen, for I know you had a long day, 
we met first day today when probably 12 hours ago i don't i, I lost it yeah so, that's fine but it's good you're holding up that's great and i want to thank everyone who came and enjoy, and joined this meeting specifically ted who is our you know great supporter of brands in knoxville tennessee i'm, I'm glad to see you glad to see Catherine, and of course everyone else here but you know we were talking about the range uh things that great lineup here by the way perfect and you know i'm taking the whole impacts team to to the distillery we left cardiff and i said guys look we have five expressions already we most likely will be pitched by one or two or three more you know that's going to be too much mm -hmm. let's just keep our poker face you know you know if you really like one of the three i will add it just you know blink with the right eye and or left whatever so we had to stay there for, for a little bit with Stephen um, at, at the meeting while the guys were visiting the distillery and tasting the samples. Think about that. We were lucky enough at Impacts to have this distilleries that would provide us with one cask at a time and give us the luxury of actually, you know, selecting those casks, you know, collectively. You know. But adding the items to the core range so we, we came to the distillery and the guys tasted pitted and rich oak and uh, portwood and guess what we left with all three that we selected and we're very happy with this so and all three recently got great accolades from san francisco world spirits competition with pitted in class double gold medal and two others getting a gold medal of each so we're extremely lucky to work with this kind of people who understand uh, our needs here and who are willing to be real partners. So why don't you? Hmm. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, look, I, I think um, when you look at uh, the success of brands, um, I suppose, like ours, um, and, you know, you, you tend to see that they tend to do really well with one or two expressions. Um, that tend to produce a lot of the volume. So we probably shouldn't lose sight of that. And if we're going to do any extension ranges, it's got to be a good reason for doing it. So uh, Sam, as I said, I think I'm, I'm, I'm most delighted about the fact that we've got a very good core range now in, into the market. I mean, you know, when we were being distributed by Sazerac, we only ever had one whiskey in the market and then they managed to get another couple in, but it didn't last. And um, so I think it's the, the most important thing for me is that you've got the core range. Um, but if, you know, if it makes sense to, uh, you know, expand that on a limited basis or, you know, then we'd be happy to do it. We've got the tools to, to do that if we need to, but I don't want to dilute the message. So I think that's really important. And I appreciate that uh, you not being pushy, not being like, you know, you need to bring this and to bring that. We're very happy with a single cast program. Yeah. Now, our first cask was sold out way, way before Whiskey Advocate gave it 93 points. Um, that was port 12 years old. The 10 years old, we probably have or maybe more sold even on, on this kind of a difficult times. And the Whiskey Advocate, who I sent the samples, already reached out to me about the bottle image, how many bottles. And that's a good sign that it's going to be featured and hopefully it's going to get a good rating. So, you know, we have two more that uh, are kind of ready to bottle. We're going to bring one at a time. I think it's a great addition that shows how, how far the distillery can go um, when it comes to quality and, and taste and uniqueness. Uh, yeah. You know, and we're, we're just, you know, happy. And thank you for allowing us to put, or to put the age statements for us. <clears throat> I know for people like us, gurus like... Uh, Robert Horton and, 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 and Drew and, and, and other people who are uh, attending this um, meeting and more, age doesn't really mean, mean anything. But from the business perspective here in the United States, when they see some double digit numbers, for whatever reason that makes its magic, magic trick. So we need to kind of consider this. I know it's not my favorite, it's not your favorite. I know you probably hate me for that, but thanks for playing. Yeah. I yeah. would just like to thank you for doing this and for a kind of a strange reason. I brought a bottle of myth and a bottle of legend home uh, to Minnesota 
because okay. I have a neighbor who introduced me to Scotch whiskey and he has tons of a whole bar full of Laphroaig and Ardbeg and all the Glenlivets. I'm, I wanted to bring him something that he didn't already have. And I happened to spot these two in the um, uh, James Pringle store in Landfair PG. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so I said, he won't have those. <laughs> brought them home, um, brought them over to his house and said, one of these is yours and one of these is mine. What we have to do now is open them and figure out which is which. Uh, okay. So um, we went from there to we ordered six bottles, a complete set for me and a complete set for him to be shipped here. This is, this is before they were available in the US. Wow. Uh, and then since then they've become available, but I've continued because I have relatives in the UK. I had, yeah. this is the, this is the, um, the Grand Slam whiskey. Yeah. Uh, the 2019 yeah. Grand Slam. And I had it shipped to, I ordered it off the website, had it shipped to my aunt's house along with a bottle of that try. Wow. Um, and um, eventually my sister bought, brought that try home with her this summer. And then I went to, I went to London for my dad's uh, birthday party and met with my aunt. She gave me this that had been under her bed for how many months. And then I also went to the whiskey exchange in Covent Garden. Yes. And I was going to buy Rhiannon. I was going to buy um, the Royal Welsh stuff. I was going to buy anything in the icons of Wales. But all they had was their Christmas special edition. Oh, really? Which was even better because I, I brought that home to him and I set it on his bar. And I was like, you notice this has a number on it. This yeah. is bottle 12 of 90. You'll yeah. never, ever get a bottle of like, like this again. This, has to, this doesn't go up on the bar. This goes in the cabinet underneath the bar. Excellent. And we only drink it on my birthday, your birthday, and St. David's Day. Wow. Excellent. So, well, thank well, you for quite and the other reason I, yeah, The other reason I thank you for doing this is when he's had a few, he always introduced me to people as Welsh. I'm only a little bit Welsh. <laughs> and when David Cover came to Minneapolis, he came to Ace Spirits and did it. And I was like, oh, yes, he's finally going to get to meet an honest to goodness Welshman. <laughs> and of course, he opened his mouth and I said, oh, nuts. <laughs> he's not a Welshman. But no. I can have him listen to the YouTube video and say, see, that's a Welshman. That's what a Welshman sounds like. There you go. And it, is on, my, it is on my bucket list to bring him to um the distillery and i think if we happen to be in wales even though if we're in wales we'll be in anglesey yeah. um so Llandudno would be a lot closer but we would have to come to pender and have to come to the village and do it properly well, I, I, do you know that you can get um you, you can or hopefully when the world opens up again you there is a flight from anglesey to cardiff uh, yes. which takes 25 minutes um mm -hmm. And it's really, really cheap flight as well. So um, if you're in, if you're in uh, Llanvair PG and you want to get down yeah. to, we'll, we'll meet you at the airport in Cardiff and then we can get you to the. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. My, my grandparents owned a house in Ross Niger, which is right next to um, RAF Valley, which is yeah. now Anglesey Airport. So yeah, of course. Yeah. 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 No, that's no, that's great. That's really good. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, Jonathan, you have to tell everybody what Clanvire PG stands for. Uh, okay, I cannot do the whole thing. I'm <laughs> I'm an Englishman, but it's Clanfair Powell Gill something 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 Clanticilio go go go. So Clanvire Pushquingle go Gareth and draw Bob Clanticilio go go go. Yes. You you were close. You were close. I think they I, I sounded try. almost exactly the same. So like, <laughs> well, that's, that's very kind, but no, <laughs> not even close. Not, not bad for an English. My wife, my wife loves it because it's a 19th century marketing ploy. Yeah. They literally named the town that to be the longest train station name any in, in England to try and get more, more tourists to come. Yeah. And, yeah. um, you know, 
she's like, it's how, when did they do this? And I was like, well, they did it in 18 something or other just to try and get more tourists. It's been yeah. working ever since. A very cynical market employee. Yes. Since Jonathan brought up the number of uh, the bottles out of the batch, here's one bottle with a number. And I'm not sure if you can see it. Do you see it? Oh, number one. Very nice. Wow. Yeah. What, can, can, somebody, can somebody explain to me how this guy keeps stealing all the good bottles? That's another one here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And oh, yeah. Iced, with iced uh, hand, handwritten signature, which is on yeah. each bottle. Excellent. That's That's nice. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm sure we could just show off our bottles all night if we wanted to, but um, you know, some of us have things to do and uh, families get back to. So uh, yeah, this this conversation will be made available with artist approval to go onto YouTube. And um, I just want to say, Stephen, thank you so much, man. This was nice. this was really great. Uh, you know, getting up this early or staying up this late for us, I really really do appreciate it. Um, you know, I. I love the brand before. I love it even more now. Uh, you know, I can't wait to, uh, you know, share these stories with everybody. And, um, you know, I, I look forward to the day that we actually get to meet in person. Yeah, look, I look forward to that too. Thanks for your time. Really appreciate uh, everything that, you know, you're all doing for us in, in the States. Um, you know, it couldn't be more exciting at the moment. It's a really, really good time for us. Uh, once we get out of the current uh, situation we're in, we're looking forward to doing more trips and, uh, you know, getting people like David and Mike and uh, and the rest of the team, you know, all of us back on the road, really. So, yeah, thanks for your support. We're really, really great to talk. Of course, of course. Uh, so, everybody, um, you know, we got two more happy hours this week. Tomorrow night is Chase Babcock from St. Benevolence. Wednesday is Matt Petrick from the Cocktail Wonk and Minimalist Tiki. Um, I'm slowly putting together the rest of the schedule or the schedule for May. Unfortunately, since it looks like we're still going to be locked down, <laughs> um, but I got some really cool people lined up. So, uh, again, everyone, thank you for coming out. And uh, like I said, I'll be posting this on YouTube if there's any parts that you missed or just really want to hear that soothing Welsh voice again. And um, we'll uh, we'll see you guys soon. Stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, cheers, everybody. Ha have a good Take night. Care. All the best. Bye bye now. Bye bye. Thank you.